You are able to see the slides, right? Yes, sir. So anyway, we'll start our uh, discussion. Okay. So I, I hope all of you have watched those videos, right? That uh, Professor Philippi and then you know Mark Panning videos. Have you seen? Those videos, YouTube videos, have you seen? Like, you know, what did you understand or what was the purpose, you know? So why we have to do this uh, planetary seismology, you know, geology you have already discussed previously. So why do we do this uh, planetary seismology? That to understand the internal structure of a planet. One, repeat once again. And... To understand the internal structure of a planet. Uh, excellent. Okay. So now you are a planetary geologist. Sir. Whatever we discussed previously, uh, that gave information only on the surface. Okay. That is the impacts or something like that. And then geological classifications, you know. And it will also help in selecting, uh, you know, the places where, you know, you have to the landing sites and other things also. Now, uh, you know, we are going more into detail. So now anyway, on the surface, we have seen what is the geological age, this one. Now we want to find out, so what is inside the planet, okay? So like, you know, at the center of the planet, what we have, you know, like whether, uh, you know, the core is liquid core or, you know, the solid core or whether it has a mantle or what the material properties so inside the planet itself. Okay? So now, nowadays, uh, you know, so if you want to find out internal structures of any planet, of course, including our Earth also, so the easy, the straightforward thing is you have to drill, you know, a hole basically, okay? So you make a borehole and then you collect the samples and you can get all the parameters. So, but now drilling hole, you know, to that much depth, so 6,000 kilometers or something is next to impossible itself, okay? So what one does is here is, you know, you do something like, uh, you know, the non-destructive testing kind of thing. So like, for example, so if you have an existing building and then you want to find out uh, inside, you know, what type of material or what are the metal properties, what is the Young's modulus and other things. So, so we use non-destructive testing, ultrasonic pulse, you know, or, you know, you hit with a hammer so someplace and you record it at other places, basically. Okay. And then, you know, using that data, so that is a response, you know, and then you solve the inverse problem and then you try to find out, you know, the Young's modulus, you know, the Poisson's ratio and the other things also. So the same non-destructive testing we try to do for uh, planets also. But then if you want to do this non-destructive testing on a planet, so which can, uh, what type of forces can excite the whole planet? See, we want the whole planet to vibrate. Then only, you know, you will find out uh, the response of the planet in all other places. Then you can find out what is inside the planet itself. So what forces can excite the whole planet? The whole planet to vibrate basically. Okay, so what type of forces or what type of things will make the planet to excite? No. See, suppose if it is a landing site, sir, like in you know, a spacecraft, uh, you follow, like you know, or something collides with uh, the planet, so whether it will excite the whole planet, sir, whether the waves travel until the core, or what, or what type of things we are looking for. So now we want to excite the whole planet, you understand? So the whole planet, we want it to vibrate, you know, then only I can get the recordings. So which forces can excite the whole planet? Internal forces in the planet. So what internal forces, you know? So we want the whole planet to vibrate, you know? Uh, which can make it vibrate? So anyway, for Earth, you can tell. So now on Earth, say, uh, which makes a whole of earth vibrating you know like a bell kind of thing say uh, which kind of forces will make it you would have watched that uh, normal modes video right that jessica area professor you know her video also you would have seen what type of forces can uh, make the whole planet you know vibrate uh, among those internal forces uh, which one makes the whole planet vibrate like a bell Now, see, in Earth, say, what type of forces will make it? The whole planet, if I want to make it vibrate, so which can make it uh, vibrate? You know? Can a nuclear explosion vibrate? Yeah. See, suppose if I carry any nuclear uh, explosion so somewhere underground the planet, so whether uh, you know, the whole planet vibrates, the whole planet vibrating means is, you know, 
if you do test in uh, japan say you should feel the vibration in us also you know other side of the thing itself you know you should be able to record the ground move or the vibrations you should be able to feel basically you know at far away places even in south america or north america say for uh, you know something which you have done at japan or if something happens in india say you should be able to record it in antarctica arctic you know all over the globe basically so what type of forces can uh, make this possible what type of forces you know which one makes the whole thing vibrate in the entire planet the gravitational force gravitational forces no gravitational forces will not make the planet vibrate so we want the whole planet to vibrate we follow it so if something happens in uh, india say it should be felt even in us it should be felt even the vibration basically okay it should be felt all over the world which can make not the gravitational force okay uh, which will make it more by a whole earth to vibrate yeah very high magnitude uh, very high magnitudes you know so that is what that's what uh, what we want, wanted uh, uh, what i want the answer is like you know earthquakes large magnitude like 9.1 magnitude earthquakes or 8.6 magnitude earthquakes so these earthquakes are something like you know very huge uh, earthquakes you know so this 9.1 magnitude earthquakes say So these earthquakes capacities it occurred in Japan, but the seismic waves say they traveled the whole globe, uh, you know, two to three times basically. The same waves, you know, it travels from Japan, it goes all around the globe, you know, several times to ten circles basically. Okay, so a large magnitude earthquakes it has a capacity to hold via earth, you know, you can feel the vibration and the if earthquake has happened in Japan, say the waves will start from Japan, they circle the whole globe and come back to Japan also, and then you know. so this happens to three to four times basically so the most so the main advantage is the large magnitude earthquakes they have the capacity to make the entire globe uh, you know the vibrate so the advantage of this uh, thing is uh, you know so the whole globe vibrates so then you know the you will see waves you know the which will pass from the core from the internal structure and all you will see variety 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 types of waves itself and the advantage is using this data sets so you can easily find out what is inside our uh, planet like non destructive testing kind of a thing okay so you can like our ultrasonic pulse testing so to find out what is inside a material so, so you can get all the information so that's why you know these quakes are uh, large magnitude quakes so they are extremely important you know uh, of course uh, they will damage that's a different issue but to know the internal structure of a planet they are very very important nuclear explosions also will do but uh, they may not the waves may not travel up to large distances because energy release is very small whereas nine magnitude is you know extremely huge kind of uh, thing itself okay so that's what they do so now to find out internal structure of a planet we want quakes basically okay so the what people try to do is you know so you you record it so the data like quake occurs somewhere in india they will put all the recordings all over the globe so you will get the data set now what we try to do is you know we find out the wave speeds density anisotropy elasticity all these things inside our earth you know so we assume something and then we do this inverse problem like the data you know you know the response of an, uh, the planet to such an earthquake now using this one so people solve the inverse problem and they will know what is inside our uh, planet so this is a uh, philosophy okay so the main uh, concept here is if you want to know the internal structure of a planet the most important thing is quakes you know whether you like it or not these large magnitude quakes is uh, so they will help you they will make the whole planet vibrate and using that data set and using a inverse problem kind of a thing you can easily find out the interior material properties you know lens modulus shear wave speeds all those things you can find out from this uh, data so that is a concept so in our earth you know it was a grand success you know the whole uh, successful this slide also you know uh, philippi would have shown you know, that uh, lecture also you have seen now in earth what happened was you know the whole earth has been instrumented actually okay so i will show you the global network also and lot of earthquakes have occurred you know small magnitudes have occurred large magnitudes all kinds of things have occurred but of course large magnitudes are very very rare basically now small magnitude earthquakes if it is a 3 magnitude or if it is a 4 magnitude the waves will not uh, circle the entire globe you know you can feel maybe up to 500 kilometers or maybe up to 1000 kilometers so but if it is a 9 magnitude 
you can feel the whole globe and then the waves you know they come back to the you know two to two to three times they circle the globe itself okay so a lot of data data has been recorded on earth and then you know people have tried this uh, tomography models they say so this non destructive testing so that is you know identifying the metal properties from the data say in seismic thing they call this as uh, tomography okay so the seismic tomography has been done and lot of metal properties the internal structure of our planet earth has been uh, you know estimated and you know uh, that initially they did one dimensional but now our understanding you know people have done 3d you know a lot of improvements have happened from this uh, data set so so now uh, we know like in earth you know now people with these data sets and we have been able to identify you see like our the center of the earth is a solid you know we have a solid core then we have uh, you know the outer core so which is a liquid kind of a thing you have then mantle mantle is like uh, you know this lava kind of material is there then we have the crust where you know we are all standing set the solid crust is there so how much is the thickness of the crust what is the thickness of the mantle thickness of the outer core inner core and its metal properties everything has been estimated from this uh, large magnitude earthquake uh, data itself okay so this has been done so this is what we try to do in our uh, planets also so the philosophy is very simple if you want to know the geological age you do that impact cratering whatever we discussed previously but if you want to know what is inside the planet say the mantle thickness core thickness or something you have to do this planetary seismology that means you have to send some instruments you record the and you wait for some type of quakes or uh, you know some impacts or whatever this one and if the whole planet gets excited so then you can find out you know the entire uh, metal properties itself but if the small magnitudes or small small things is there then maybe you can find out you know only up to some few kilometers itself so this is the idea so instrument it so you get this uh, data from this type of instruments and then you know you assume some models you run your simulations or whatever and then from the data so you do inversion and then get this uh, model parameters itself so the seismic inversion or this is what they call as the seismic tomography you know so it is essentially a non destructive uh, testing itself so that is why you know this instrumentation becomes extremely important itself and this is one slide you know which is very important this graph uh, you know the seismic spectrum they say like you see there is what they call as reflection seismology then the body waves uh, you know so these are the the natural time periods say of these waves then the normal modes you know has been shown here and the crustal deformation also so you have seen right what do you mean by normal mode uh, so you i hope all of you had watched that lecture itself what is the definition of a normal mode the pattern in which the entire of earth oscillates yeah excellent so that is a basic mode shape you know that is how the earth oscillates so earth will uh, oscillate earth oscillations of course earth oscillates a complicated way only but mathematically one can show that this complicated things so you can expand in terms of some uh, you know four year series kind of a thing so generally you know right in our mathematics is uh, whenever you see any time history so we expand in terms of four year series even in our dynamics also you know for cantilever beam or you know if you want to find out the mode shapes is uh, so we expand in terms of sinusoidal or buckling mode shapes you know these type of uh, things so for earth also because it's a sphere you know you have something like a basic mode shape that's what we call as you know, the normal modes or the spherical uh, harmonics of our uh, planet earth. of course the normal modes will have long uh, you know the periods because you know the whole earth has to vibrate you know, so their periodicity will be extremely large hundreds of seconds you know thousand you know 10000 seconds will be there then we have the crustal deformation these are very very slow process basically okay like a cooling of a planet or you know the crust is getting deformed say so these are the spectrums so when you are designing a instrument so you should be able to design instrument so if you want to capture normal modes you say so your instrument should have a capacity you know to record these long uh, periods itself you know like that okay so this is how the uh, instrumentation you see how they design basically you know based on this uh, things itself and not only the normal modes if you want so if you want the normal modes to get excited that means the whole planet has to vibrate so the only possibility is you know the large magnitude earthquakes are you know that may be able to excite this normal modes so if you have small magnitude or small small things so they may excite only the body waves but this they may not excite actually okay so this will tell us okay so how you know what type of instruments you have to use and the frequency or the time periods is of this type of uh, things itself okay so anyway so now what we will do is uh, you know 
So, the, so these quakes are very important. So before we go into the planetary seismology and others, I want all of you to understand uh, you know, the earthquakes basically, okay? Because the same concept we will be utilizing on Moon and then uh, Mars also. So some of you would have already you know, studied these using other uh, courses also. Just I will have a brief uh, review. What do you mean by earthquake and other things also, okay? But here our focus is on uh, not on the earthquake resistant design or something like that. Our focus is on mostly on the internal structure of our planet Earth. So if you want to know the internal structure of our planet Earth, the only way is you know these earthquakes only, and the large magnitude earthquakes itself. Okay. So these are definition. So earthquake means you see a sudden movement of the ground, you know, that releases elastic energy, stored in the rocks, and it generates you know these seismic waves. Okay. So this is the most important uh, you know the concept of you know this uh, definition of an earthquake. So now what happens is, you know, once initial ground movement happens, so the seismic waves gets generated and they propagate outward. And if it's a large magnitude, so they will vibrate the whole earth itself and they will travel the whole earth two to three times basically. Okay, so this is the definition of earthquake. So now this is what you see we call as a faults, like in Moon, you would have seen in QGA software also. So the faults you can easily identify from that itself. So in earthquake, what happens is the sudden movement happens actually. Okay. And now can anybody, you know, tell me what is the speed of this rupture? Like what is the, how fast it happens, this movements, uh, what is the speed of this rupture? So in earthquake, these two plates move basically, okay? It was like this, now it suddenly moves. So sudden means how much faster it is. Yeah. So what is the velocity of this rupture? So previous classes we have seen, right? The impact velocity, the projectiles impacts we have seen. Like an earth we have said that meteorite impacts velocity will be you know, 16 kilometer per second. Uh, you remember, right? On moon, it will be 20 kilometer per second. So they are all hypersonic kind of thing. Now in earthquakes, what is the, velo what is the rupture velocity? How much fast these things move? Yeah. So what is the velocity of rupture? Uh, with what velocity this rupture happens? Three to four kilometer per second. Uh, tell me. Three to three kilometer per second. Ah, three kilometer. It is basically two to three kilometer per second. So that is also extremely, you know, fast kind of a thing. Okay. So when things happen very fast, sir. So what happens, you know, these, uh, uh, but here, suppose if the velocity is more than, uh, you know, it's like five kilometer or six kilometer per second, or if it is a 10 kilometer per second, so what will happen? See, if the rupture happens at, uh, you know, 10 kilometer or a very high velocity, so 15 kilometer per second. So what will happen here? Uh, so what happens? If the velocity is at 10 kilometer, 15 kilometer per second, so the fault moves at that fast velocity, what will happen? See, we have seen, right, the impact mechanics, you know, that meteorite impacts. So there the velocities are 16 kilometers per second. So what type of waves will get generated there? Shock wave. Uh, shock waves actually, okay, so excellent. So if the velocities are so high, sir, shock waves will get generated. But if the velocities are small, so three kilometer per second, two kilometer per second, less than, you know, the mediums uh, velocity or whatever, so shock waves will not get generated. You will be generating only elastic waves only. Okay, so that is the difference between earthquakes and this impact cratering. Please remember, so impact cratering means because the velocities are hypersonic velocities, so you will have shock waves, and as the distance increases, so then you will be having elastic waves also. But in earthquakes, you know, we don't have velocities uh, you know, as high as uh, you know, that much, uh, this one. So here you will be seeing only, you know, of course, there are some few earthquakes are there where rupture velocities are extremely high, Shock waves also are observed, but most many times, you know, we will see these type of elastic waves only, okay? So, one, because the rupture happens so fast, sir, so you will see these type of seismic, you know, the waves will get generated and the seismic waves, sir, so they will cause vibration actually on the surface, which anyway, you know, we are interested and uh, you followed it. We want to record this data and then, you know, so that we can estimate, you know, the internal structure of our uh, planet itself, okay? So anyway, so this is what, uh, you know, so, so many times, you know, we also do use these type of notations actually, okay? So earthquake means we also call this as event, you know, that we also means uh, earthquake itself, teleseism also some of the words which are widely used, the main shock, core shock, after shock basically. So main shock is the main earthquake. So generally whenever an earthquake occurs, say, not only on Earth or even on moon quakes or Mars quakes also, 
So whenever anything major thing is happening, sir. So what happens before that? You, know, you will see four shocks actually. So small, 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 small adjustments will take place that we call as a four shock. Then once the main earthquake has occurred, sir, then also small, small adjustments takes place in that region, and you know earthquakes will occur. So this we call the as you know, the aftershock also. Okay. So these are some terminology we use in this uh, earthquake you know, to define an earthquake itself. Okay. Now, why do earthquakes occur basically, sir? So the main reason, uh, you know, why, why these quakes are occurring on Earth is a very important thing. So now, uh, you know, as already I told you, right, you see, so now in our Earth, sir, so the basic thing why earthquakes occur on Earth is, you know, this is a mantle convection, they say, okay? So you all know, right, so the hot water, so, so when you heat it, you know, so you will have this type of hot water, it becomes light, it comes to surface, and then, you know, so this comes basically. So this, what happens is the convection currents, you know, they move the entire uh, thing itself. So this causes basically, you know, the earthquakes itself. And why this happens is because I already told you, right, 4.5 billion years ago, you know, we have that Hadean era, Archean era, I showed you all the geological ages, because at that time the temperatures are extremely hot, say. So then slowly solidification, you know, the rocks have started forming and other things happen. So this heat inside our earth is extremely hot, say. And we have this, uh, you know, so these are our solid inner core, this one and outer, this one mantle is here. And here the temperature is around 6,000 degrees centigrade at our, uh, you know, the center of that. And at the surface, uh, the temperatures are of the order of, you know, 30 degrees or 40 degrees centigrade or whatever. And then this mantle and then these all liquid kind of, you know, lava kind of materials. Uh. So because of this huge temperature difference, you know, so this mantle convection basically it happens. Uh. So because of the mantle convection, so the crust, you know, it creates cracks and then, uh, you know, there's a plate tectonics and all other things comes into picture, okay? So these are most important things. So the why earthquakes occur, why earthquakes occur on our planet Earth is the main reason has been attributed to the mantle convection, okay? This is extremely, you know, the very important thing. So this is a main mantle convection and of course, this mantle convection has created a plate tectonics and then, you know, so this has created the earthquakes itself, okay? So these are the reason why quakes are occurring on our planet, basically. Now, why quakes we are up So these what we said. So the yeah, center of Earth, we have 5,500 or 6,000 degrees centigrade. And surface, you know, then the outer core is 5,000, then 1,200. Then when it comes to the surface, so 30 degrees or 40 degrees centigrade will be the temperature because of the huge temperature differences. Eh? So you will see this, uh, you know, the lava, you followed it, the convection currents. And the whole crust is there. It has splitted the crust, and that is what you see. People say that oceans have formed, and then you know these uh, entire things are uh, moving itself. Okay, so this is the reason why quakes occur on our uh, planet itself. And then there are also you know the mantle plumes, uh, so, uh, established theory. So what happens is there are points in our Earth basically. So these are the points where you know the crust has broken, or you know the lava which comes out. Uh, you know already I think we I showed you long, you know, the stratigraphy and other things also. So these volcanoes, these dikes or whatever, you know, so these hot materials, it comes to the surface. So this is what they call as you know, the mantle plumes, basically. Okay, so the mathematical models have been there and people have observed also these mantle plumes. So the best example, you know, the mantle plumes. So, so the lava you know, is coming out from the mantle to the crust and then it solidifies. Okay, so the best example, uh, you know, I told you the, the, the previous classes itself. Yeah. Which is the best country, you know, where you will see all kinds of geological things in the whole our uh, you know, among all the countries. Uh, which is the best place to uh, you know, all kinds of geological features you will see? Iceland. Uh, Iceland. Okay. So because Iceland has been formed due to mantle plume only. So you can see these channels. Uh, so this mantle plume has come. You can see here. So the mantle plume has come up to the surface, and you can see this Iceland. So Iceland, uh, you know, you can have volcanoes. You have all kinds of things also. And as already I told you, all the astronauts uh, they are taken to Iceland, you know, for the geological training itself before going to other uh, planetary explorations. Okay. So anyway, so this is our Earth. Okay. So you know, right? So this uh, mantle plumes or whatever say. So they have splitted the tectonic plates and, you know, right, all the story like India, everything was one and then, you know, the things have moved and then you see this is how the Indian plate and other things have been formed also, okay. Now you can easily find out all these things from our, uh, you know, this one hot spots. So these are uh, circuit, these are triangles you can see, right, these are all the hot spots. Right? So that is where still, you know, the lava is coming and ocean flows and other things are also coming up. So you can easily see these things nowadays in our Google Earth also. So if you plot the topography maps in our Google Earth, if you see here, uh, you can see below the ocean, so the bathymetry data, you can see all these type of, uh, you know, like this, uh, you know, the 
uh, crack crack kind of thing you can see here in our uh, versions basically so this is a place is uh, the crust has been broken and then you know the things are uh, slightly moving so this is a uh, crust is uh, where you know where this is uh, south america and this is africa you know so this is where so this crust has been broken and then uh, you know these two things are moving far away from uh, each other except okay so this is in japan so you can see this is our uh, japan so it's a pacific plate we say and this is a asian uh, plate itself you can see this type of subduction and other things also and then you can see taiwan you know so a huge uh, subduction happens in taiwan so this is why you see the quakes get formed in this uh, region itself and then the heat flow maps is uh, now the technology because you know, in the planetary explorations also we are going to use this heat flow so you can see so wherever the heat is uh, high say so what does it tells you yeah, suppose here the heat flow means you know extremely high there. these places are extremely hot actually so what is that this tells you yeah. so you can see in our india say here also the heat is uh, you know this red color shows you know, very high heat actually so what is the meaning of this one if you say high heat here If the heat flow is more so what does it tells you yeah, this place dark red color so what it tells you the heat flow magma from the mantle is coming up yeah so the mantle is coming up so that is how you know that means you know this is very active region you know the mantle is coming up and then so here you know the velocities will be high something like that you can interfere and then, and then if you see the age of the ocean floor so like i already told you the geological ages okay so people have but of course here there is no requirement of impacts or other things you can go there and you can collect the samples also so this routinely you know people do okay so now if you see the geological ages so from all the samples now you can see this color indicates the age basically okay so now you can these are all the lines so wherever is a red color the age is almost you know 10 million years are very very small so which means these are all very young compared to these places itself you know so you can see there the mantle is coming up and you know easily you can identify all these features right now on our planet Earth because we have all the samples you can go there you can get the samples you can carbon date it in the lab and you can find out all these features itself so this is also between you know south america and this one so this red lines it shows the age is very very young you know the rocks you can find out just a few million years old things you can find out here and as you go far away from this place uh, the age of the rocks are uh, extremely old uh, you know kind of rocks you can find out in these uh, places itself okay and of course anyway so these uh, things are very well known and then you know people have identified based on the ages and then you know the heat flow then all other uh, things itself the whole earth is, uh, can be divided into several uh, you know the tectonic plates itself i think now some 43 tectonic plates have been there now previously say indo australian plate people used to say india australia was one plate but 2004 sumatra earthquake say so that has created a rift basically okay so now indian plate is separate australian plate, australian plate is also separate from that. some of the 43 main plates and maybe some micro plates are there you know. so the one peter bird one professor you know so he has made this uh, study also okay and now here this is also very important and now here uh, you know these uh, plate movements say so these are they have created you know three types of uh, plate boundaries we say which are very important for our planetary seismology also okay now when the two plates are moving far away from each other say so then we call this as you know spreading plate boundary now when two plates are coming to each other say, and then colliding so this, this is what we call as a collision collusion boundary and then when the plates say they are also moving but they are parallel but in the opposite directions say. so this is one type of uh, boundary itself so spreading uh, boundary then colliding boundary then of course if there is no spread no colliding just they are moving parallel kind of things itself so these type of three plate boundaries they have created to three type of uh, faults itself okay now in your mechanics of materials you would have studied how many types of stresses are there now in our mechanics of materials so how many type of stresses are there in our entire structural mechanics See how many type of stresses are there in mechanics? Normal and shear. Uh, normal and shear stresses, okay. So normal, how many type of normal stresses are there? See the normal stress, uh, you have uh, compressive stress, you have 
tensile stress and then you have shear stress actually okay and now you tell me so now suppose if it is spreading kind of thing so two things are moving away from each other okay so what type of stresses will be there tensile tensile now if it is a collusion say when two things are colliding actually what type of stresses will be there compressive uh, now if you hear we have parallel say but in the opposite direction what type of stresses shear so just moving uh, shear stresses okay so these three type of stresses will create three type of faults actually okay so one is a strike slip fault so strike slip fault is created purely due to pure shear kind of thing thrust means you know this is a compressive stress normal say it is basically a tensile kind of uh, stress itself okay so it's a very easy to classify so what type of faults are there we will understand for moon and other planets also what type of faults are there this will play a very major you know, role later on okay so three type of faults Uh, why three type of faults? Because three type of boundaries and three type of faults. But there are some other boundaries also where you will see a combination. Okay, they may be moving parallel. The combination of shear plus compression or shear plus normal oblique. That is also a possibility there. But these are the three fundamental modes you can say. Okay, the three fundamental kind of things which you have on the on the faults itself. Okay. Now India, all of you know. Okay, so it moves at six five centimeter per year. Uh, that's what i told you you know so now if you want to measure the indian plate velocity is okay it is basically 5 cm per year it is uh, you remember the seismic spectrum say okay so what uh, you know uh, crustal deformation uh, this slide if you see uh, you can see so if you want to measure indian plate velocity basically so what you have to do what is its uh, thing uh, what is the frequency of this one uh, can you identify here what is the frequency of crustal deformation if you want to identify a plate velocity say what type of instruments you have to design you should design instrument which can record 5 cm per year you followed so in a year it moves only 5 cm so your periodicity or that instrument say it should be able to record what is you can see here uh, what is the frequency here for crustal differ very very slow extremely slow process actually so what is its frequency so 10 to the power minus 5 to 7 yeah uh, so it is a very very extreme so you so you have to design instruments you know which are very very sensitive so which can record these type of uh, data sets also okay so that's what we see the crustal deformations okay so this is also very important you know in uh, identifying you see these all these uh, features itself okay so this is what they say yeah. now anyway india's uh, thing we all of you know like india asia you follow it right? they collided and then you see the himalayas have been formed so this has created a mountain structure so the same features say you should have able to identify in our mars or uh, you know the moon itself say suppose if you see a mountain chain or something say so the question is whether this has been formed due to lava or it is due to impact craters or it is due to this type of a quakes you know we have to identify all these features also now in our earth say so the himalayas you know you can easily identify see in google earth you, know, you can rotate it nicely you can see this is uh, tibet that is uh, this region and this is our india if you see this to compare say it is something like you know it's like a composite plate kind of a thing so you will see this huge uh, mountain chain you know so this is himalayas you follow it right? so you can easily identify from the remote sense that you know images itself so similar type of features so you should be able to identify on other uh, planets also but the earth luckily you know we do have instruments you know you can go to that place the geology can be studied so we you know of course these things are much controlled you know, on our uh, planet earth itself so anyway so what type of faults are there in himalayas uh, so can you tell me strike slip or normal or thrust faults what type of stresses will be there in himalayas no. may, may, major stresses what type of stresses will be there here what type of plate boundary it is convergent boundary what convergent so what type of plate boundary we have said right three boundaries are there spreading collusion or uh, the other one So among these three, which is the major one? Collision. Uh, collusion. So collusion means what type of stress? Compressive. Uh, compressive means what type of faults? So I told you right. Uh, thrust are normal. Strike slip means a pure shear. Thrust means compression. Normal means tension. So what type of faults will be there in Himalayas? Thrust. thrust faults itself okay so without going into any details you can easily tell us okay but if there is a fault which is a perpendicular to himalayas what type of stress will be there 
so the whole himalaya so the all the faults so the himalaya whole himalaya will be under compression this one suppose if i have uh, faults which is perpendicular to himalaya yeah. so what type of stress will be there perpendicular uh, you can see the india is also moving along this uh, line okay so this one will be in compression the faults which are parallel to himalaya will be under compression but perpendicular to himalaya Sure. Uh, it will be shear basically. So shear means that there will be strike slip faults will be there. Okay. So like that, you know, you have to identify among the, you know these things. Okay. So anyway, so the more, but majority of the faults is like faults which are parallel to Himalaya. They all will be you know the thrust kind of mechanisms itself. And of course, this is also very important classification. Now on our planet Earth, say what happens is the whole India is under compression because of the collusion actually. So when things are uh, full, when the compression is maximum near the boundary, that is near the Himalayas or the plate boundaries. Now what happens is when the whole uh, plate is under stress, is there. so uh, what happens is majority, you know, there is 80% uh, you know, of the stress, it's a thumb rule, you know. So our 80% of the energy, so they get released near the boundary itself and the remaining 20%, so say, they get released in the interior of the uh, plate itself, okay. So that means you know, 80 percent earthquakes will occur near the boundary, remaining 20 percent or something, it just occurs within the interior of the plate itself. So this is what we call as interplate and intraplate earthquakes. So the very important thing because interplate means the earthquakes which occur between the plates, like you know, the Himalayas, which is the plate boundary, we call this as interplate earthquake. Then intraplate means which occurs inside the Indian plate also. Okay, so like you can see. So you can easily find it. If you find out all the earthquakes which are occurring in India and then you classify, you know, so 80% or 90, 80 to 90% will be along the Himalayas. The remaining 20% will be inside the Indian plate. So the earthquakes which are occurring in Koina earthquake or Kilari earthquake or, you know, the earthquakes in the Indian shield say. So this we call them as intraplate earthquakes itself. Okay, so this is a clear cut definition. And then uh, later on we will see in Mars or Moon say. The plate tectonics is absent basically. So in Mar 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 Mars and Moon, the data, all kinds of quakes which are occurring on them are of mostly interplate itself. So intraplate, you know, the earthquakes that is within the plate. Okay. So we'll come to that one, you know, maybe by next class or whatever. Okay. And now if you see the faults, you say there are faults which are perpendicular to Himalaya. So like you see, you can see Great Boundary Fault, Delhi Haridwar Ridge, West Patna Faults, you know, Faizabad Ridge, Lucknow Fault. These are all the faults which are perpendicular to Himalaya. So whenever earthquake occurs here, so they will go strike slip mechanism. You know? But the MCT, MBT, so, so these are the faults which are parallel to the Himalayas. Their earthquakes will be having, you know, this a thrust type of uh, mechanism. Itself, okay, so please remember interplate, intraplate. Now in Moon and Mars, you say, as far as we know, everybody say there are all uh, similarities between our intraplate earthquakes and then you know the Mars and then Moon. Uh, so, okay, so this we will see after uh, some point of time. So now why do earthquakes? So now apart from this, uh, you know, the earthquakes, is, as already I told, earthquakes are very, very important to know the internal structure of a planet itself. Now sometimes, you know, if you want to excite a planet, so instead of an earthquake, you can also do induce the seismicity, which people have tried on uh, moon and other places also, you know, like you see, impacting a satellite directly on moon, say, and then they recorded the data also. I will show you after some point of a time. So it's what we call as induced seismicity also. Now on earth, say, so what happens is, you know, people have carried out nuclear explosions also. They do generally below the underground, this one. So this also excites, you know, the whole planet. But of course, their capacity is very small, not as a large as a large magnitude earthquake itself. So nuclear explosion is maybe 3 like magnitude or 4 magnitude or 5 magnitude, you know, this kind of explosion will be there. And now recently, you remember, right, Tonga, that volcano explosion happened in the month of January. Uh, can anybody tell me the magnitude? What was the magnitude of that explosion for the Tonga, you know, that volcano, I think that explosion happened, right? Yeah. Any of you know the Tonga explosion? So what was the magnitude? I knew or something. Uh, around the five magnitude it was, you know. So that is a huge explosion basically. Okay, so five magnitude, you know, the thing. And it seems the Tonga explosion, so they have recorded even in Switzerland and, you know, the other places also that has been recorded, basically. So that, so these also, you know, so if you want to create the whole, if you want to know the, uh, if you want to excite the whole uh, planet, say, apart from uh, earthquakes itself, you can do these type of nuclear explosions and other things. Also. And there were some proposals also, like, you know, 
to do nuclear explosion on moon or mars basically okay and then you record the data and then you will find out the internal structure of a planet okay so all these things you know, people tried but they did not do this uh, nuclear explosion on other planets itself okay so anyway so this is what you know the intraplanet uh, you know the earthquakes which occur inside this like a coina large magnitude earthquakes occur in this uh, area itself okay now how do we record this earthquakes basically this is the most uh, important thing you know in our planetary seismology so now how to devise you know what type of instrument you have to do so you can't have a as already i told you if you want to know the internal structure of a planet so if you want to design any seismic instrument so you know the ideal instrument is you know you should be able to develop an instrumentation so which can record all these bands you know like reflection seismology body wave normal mode crustal deformation say so if you, if you can design instrument which can record from you know 1000 uh, hertz to 10 to the power of minus 7 hertz basically okay so then you can record all these things itself now uh, till now you know our technology has not been uh, you know that much this one so we don't have right now instruments which can record all the bands of the seismic spectrum you follow so we are having instruments you know there are instruments which can record only you know from 0.1 to 10 hertz then we have instruments which can record up to 100 hertz you know, separate 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 it's special you know the instruments are uh, Are coming up basically now. If you want to measure crustal deformation, say now, uh, which is instruments widely used for crustal deformations? Yeah. Can anybody know this name? That is a long period basically, yeah. long as uh, are very low frequency. Or if you want to identify the phenomena, say which are occurring, uh, you know, five uh, centimeter per year or ten centimeter per year, sir. What type of instruments people are using? Uh, any of you have an idea? Yeah, so which is the instrument widely used to find out this long, uh, you know, or long duration, this deformations, you know, if things are happening like in you know, a yearly or you know the ten years or something. So which instrument we are using right now? Satellite. The satellite only. But you all of you are having in your mobiles, you know, what is that instrument? The GPS. Ah, uh, GPS. Excellent. Okay. So what is a GPS? So GPS is a special instrument, you know. So, but that GPS can record only, you know, the uh, low, uh, that you know, ten to the power of minus seven. But the problem of GPS is it cannot record, uh, you know, these uh, high frequencies. You follow? So we don't have instruments you know, which can record from thousand hertz to ten to the power of minus seven hertz, basically. Okay. So we are having several, several instruments. So now, if you want to do planetary exploration or this one, so now uh, you know you have to decide what type of instrument we have to send. what type of things you know and what is the objective also you know what is that we are looking for we follow so this is a very very important you know the instrumentation okay and now large amounts so people have done so many things but of course on earth itself it is a too complicated but if you want to send it on other planets it is extremely you know you have to do lot of studies on you know what type of instrument what you are going to measure you know all those details one has to verify very you know thoroughly itself and now how do we record these quakes is it uh, now uh, you know uh, displacement you know, generally you know we are having instruments also now the question comes is what you want to record you follow it right? whether you want to record displacement or you want to record velocity or you want to record acceleration of course it looks very mathematically speaking uh, you know everybody says you know, if you have a displacement you differentiate it you will get velocity uh, no need to have an instrument which can record all three components you can have instrument if you record one you can obtain other two also it's very easy to tell okay but when you record the data and then you, when you try to do the differentiation because of instrumental noise will be there you know it is extremely difficult you know so you have to do this differentiation of the data or you know to integrate the data so we'll have lot of uh, problems itself okay and then that's what we said so now if you want to have a seismometer sir what should be the sampling rate you followed so like you know 20 times per second it should record or 50 times per second it should record so as already i told you right from reflection seismology so you have huge uh, you know variety of spectrum is there so what should be the sampling rate you know this also becomes extremely you know important itself and then when you see the ground motion so the instrument also ground motion is basically it is a vector you know you have all three components so vertical component north south and east west also you know so three components will be there so generally all the instruments you say they will have three components you will see they are extremely important in which component to use for this uh, tomography also okay so now generally you know the three components so generally what one does is north south east west nobody uses so the retort the coordinate system such that you know we will uh, orient towards radial tangent will also you know people try to do and to identify this uh, you know the phenomena itself okay the rotated uh, components also will be used 
the advantage you know if you rotate it uh, towards its epicenter so the transverse components will contain some type of a waves the radial component will be giving some type of waves and you can observe some uh, you can get some kind of a physical meaning from this uh, data set itself okay so there are a lot of instruments have been devised one is uh, you know the seismoscope you know one instrument was there now no more uh, you know it is nobody uses it records only you know uh, occurrence of ground motion it just records when a thing has occurred or not then seismometer is there so this is the one we use you know and uh, so it is instrument basically so that senses ground motion and then converts into you know this is a signal kind of a thing then accelerometers are there which records acceleration itself then we have a geophone basically okay so these are special instruments an active source seismology then gps is there so like that so many instruments have been uh, devised okay but uh, you don't but we don't have any single instrument which can record all frequencies or all the seismic spectrum from 1000 hertz to 10 to the power of minus 7 so we don't have an instrument at all we have instruments which will operate in uh, you know like a sequence some instruments operate in this range some instrument app operates in this range itself okay so right now uh, generally to record this type of earthquakes say, or even uh, quakes itself two instruments are widely used even in planetary exploration itself one is what they call as a broadband seismometer okay so this is a very you know instrument and this you know, instrument is you know, it can record weak motions basically that means you know if thing happens in uh, you know india say earthquake happens in india it can even record in america so it can sense that vibration very you know the very low frequency kind of a thing and it can be sensed basically from 0 0.02 to 1000 seconds actually this is a very very special instrument and very expensive instrument also and it can record this is the velocity itself and then we have the strong motion accelerometer also so this instrument was devised by engineers you know because as an engineer say all of you know right if you give displacement velocity and acceleration say which is more uh, engineers want you know, which one we prefer among the acceleration velocity and displacement so which we like Generally, in our engineering, so as a civil engineer, which one you prefer? Acceleration or displacement or velocity? And why? What is the reason? Yeah, so, what is the reason? So, which one you like? Acceleration, displacement, or velocity? So as an engineer, so which is more, uh, which one you are more comfortable with these three? Of course, all three are uh, related to one way, but which one you prefer? Generally, as an engineer, you know. Now, which one we like? Now, tell me. You people are there, Kshitej, you are there. Yeah. So which one is more preferable for engineer among these three? Yes, sir, maybe for, uh, maybe acceleration. Why? What you told is correct only. What is, what could be the reason? As a civil engineer, I'm asking. Yeah. Sir, we can compute forces also. Uh, excellent. Okay. So F is equal to MA, you follow, right? So engineers, you know, Acceleration is there. You find multiply mass of the building, you will find out the force actually. So the strong motion accelerographs is there. But these accelerations are very, you know, uh, broadband velocity means you know because it's a low frequency, you can record up to long seconds. Okay. So these instruments have been done for uh, you know the engineering purposes. Okay. So now, uh, but these instruments, broadband seismographs, so they are you know the advantage of broadband seismometers is you know they are very sensitive. And they can record long periods, you know. So if earthquake happens in Japan, sir, if you want to record it in uh, North America or South America, sir, okay, broadband seismometer will be able to record, you know, this a thousand second, this one. But strong motion accelerograph, it will not be able to record this type of uh, data itself. So strong motion accelerographs, they operate in, uh, you know, this extreme side of the spectrum, okay, that is, you know, the high frequency spectrum. But broadband seismometers, they operate in the, uh, you know, the long period uh, this of the spectrum. And of course, GPS is this extreme actual, crustal deformation and other. So these are the things which are widely used in uh, Earth also. And of course, and, uh, whenever a mission happens, say, like on Mars or Moon, say, now which one you will send? So if you are, uh, you know, the payload in charge, say, so which instruments you would like to send it to Mars or Moon, you will send strong motion accelerograph or you will send broadband seismometer. Now, which instrument is more preferable? Of course, as an engineer, you like strong motion accelerometer. That's a different part of the story. 
But if I want to find out internal structure of a planet, sir, which instrument will be more favorable? Strong motion or broadband? Yeah. Which instrument can be used? We are not interested in civil engineering. We are interested in finding internal structure. Yeah. So which instrument will have advantage? Yeah, tell me, which instrument will have advantage? The bro broadband system. Uh, broadband, why the advantage is? The broadband can record a thousand seconds. So obviously you can record, uh, you know, if any, like a moon, sir, if any quake happens in any place on the moon, it will be able to record. Suppose if you send a strong motion accelerograph to moon, sir, what happens? Sir? No. So if there is a quake very nearby, like in 100 kilometer or 200 kilometer only, it will be able to sense. But if a quake happens in a far side of the moon or 1000 kilometers, it will not be able to record that data itself. Okay. So this is a very important thing. So you have to decide what instrument you want to send it, what is your objective and other things also. So because internal structure of a planet, sir, we will be more interested in the broadband, you know, the seismograph itself. Okay. Now these are the instruments. Okay. So this is how the seismic instrument looks like. Okay. So you can see in Google. So this is how the broadband seismograph looks like. You can see here, it looks like a drum kind of a cylinder kind of a thing. But a very expensive, almost the broadband seismograph will cost you, you know, 20 to 30 lakhs basically because it's a very sensitive instrument. Okay. And these are strong motion, the Titan SMA. So you can see here. So these are instruments which can measure uh, you know, the accelerations, the essential, okay, the earthquake accelerations. And it, I think its capacity is, uh, you know, some around, uh, you know, some 0.5 hertz to 50 hertz, you know, it can easily measure. Then this also, this price will be around 6 lakhs kind of a thing. And then now, uh, you know, this is also basalt, you know, one more strong motion accelerograph. Now, one special instrument has been devised recently, you know, because of technological advances. So this, uh, this has been done by Japanese people. So this instrument has a cap capacity. It can record even, uh, you know, the low frequency as well as high frequency. But this instrument is extremely expensive uh, thing. But now maybe, you know, slowly so this instrument may also, you know, maybe manufacturing that, but people are slowly moving to these type of instruments also, okay? So this, this is how the instruments looks like basically. So now when you record this data, so I'm showing an arc, you know, so the data looks like this. So these, I think the displacements here. So once the displacements are there, say, so instruments, you know, they record only broadband means it records only velocity. If it is strong motion micrographs, it records only the uh, velocities. And if it is a GPS instruments, it records only the displacement. Okay. So like this, it has. So once you have displacements, so you can integrate or you can differentiate, you know, you can obtain the other uh, quantities itself. So these are some, uh, you know, the IJK, okay, the Kalpakam, we have a seismic network is operating there. So these how the time histories looks like. There was one small earthquake near Velur, say, time histories looks like this. And now you can see there is one 8.1 magnitude, which occurred in Santa Cruz Islands, California. You know, it was very far away from IJK, but this instrument has recorded, you know, these are all the, you know, EMP means Anupuram, Chengalpattu, CRS, Illalur, you know, so the, all these stations have recorded also. So these are all broadband instruments. So broadband means it can record near field, it can record far field also. Okay. So these are advantage of this instrument. So. And these are some strong motion instruments. Okay. I think some Uttarkashi earthquake, Koina earthquake. Say. So they have been recorded here. But these uh, capacity of these instruments is they will not be able to record the small, small things like two magnitude, one magnitude, they will not be able to record. And earthquakes are happening at large distances. So they will not be able to record this type of uh, data itself. Okay. So now, uh, so we have seen, so now we have, have told you about the data basically. Now, how do we use this data and then, you know, how to do this, uh, you know, the find out the metal properties and other things. Uh. So here one should know how the medium responds to earthquakes itself. Okay. This is a very important thing. As already I told you, sir, whenever there is an earthquake, so what type of waves will get generated? And if there is an impact, say, what type of waves will get generated during an uh, asteroid impact? What type of waves will get generated whenever there is an earthquake? Yeah. Yeah, just now we told right in the starting, what type of waves will get generated during an earthquake? Yeah. Earthquake. Yeah. Earthquakes. Uh, why elastic waves? Because uh, velocity, sir? Yeah. Velocity, sir, no. Uh, velocities are 3 km per second only, okay? So you will have only elastic waves. But of course, in earthquakes also special cases are there. The velocity is high, so shock waves also will get. But if it is impact uh, things, asteroid impact, 
the velocities are hypersonic okay so there you will see large uh, you know shock waves plus elastic waves also will be there but in earthquakes you will have slow you know compared to impact it's not slow means it is not this slow it is 3 km per second is also very high you will generate elastic waves only so now uh, you know uh, the best example is a shock wave which is shock wave is not a non elastic wave so the reason is you know uh, we have seen right whenever there is a shock wave so material gets cracked you know so the whole medium say uh, you follow it it still will get changed you have seen right in when a shock wave propagates what happens so if you have a you know graphite say and if it is subjected to shock wave what happens in graphite it be it can, what happens to graphite when there is a shock wave and this happens what what happens to that one becomes diamond now it becomes diamond so what does it mean so the fundamental structure of the medium itself is getting changed actually okay so we have seen right there that shatter cones or whatever you know so the entire uh, shock metamorphism we discussed previously so shock waves are very you know the metal properties and other things also everything will gets changed basically but luckily in earthquakes we are having only elastic waves elastic waves means metal properties are not going to change so it, but uh, you will see these type of vibrations itself okay that's the main difference between a shock wave and elastic waves okay so this you should be able to uh, you know differentiate between these two very clearly okay so now in our uh, elastic waves is said it is applicable to all uh, materials itself or uh, two type of things are there okay so like one is a, what they call as a surface wave other one is a body wave basically so body waves you know you will see p type p waves and s waves so these are also very simple to remember so as already i told you in any continuum mechanics whatever you have studied it's so a two type of stresses only one is a normal stress other one is a shear stress only so normal stresses are associated with the p waves and shear stresses so they are associated with s waves itself okay so this we call as you know, the body waves and then the among the surface waves you are having variety variety of the surface waves and of course they travel on the surface or whatever they say two type of waves have been differentiated okay one is a low wave other one is a rally waves actually okay so these four waves are very very important and you can easily identify these four waves on a seismograph okay of course there are other type of waves are there but it is very difficult to identify uh, from where they are coming and uh, you know uh, understanding that one. but these four one can identify easily on a seismograph itself okay and of course mathematically also you can show that you know in a continuum mechanics is there of course kshitij would have done uh, he would have not done the other courses but if you see mechanics and metal these are fundamental equations okay for isotropic solids say. so you write equation like this and from helmholtz theorem so you can decompose into two portions and then you can show that you know in a medium there exists only two type of waves only that is a p wave and s wave and p waves velocity is root of e by rho also we write things more or less another one is related to the shear modulus itself okay so one is a tensile stress compressive stress other one is shear type of uh, things so these are the two body waves and now in elastic waves as well, now in the surface waves and body waves you can easily differentiate in the seismogram the body waves the amplitudes will be very small okay and then they will have short wavelength also and they will have a narrow frequency band and of course they travel more quickly very fast actually and uh, whenever you're having a seismogram so the first initial waves will be body waves only now the surface waves they will have large amplitudes and then wavelengths will be very long and wide range of frequencies will be there okay so large bandwidth uh, you know you will be having for the surface waves and of course they travel very slowly so they will come later stage okay the body waves comes first surface waves comes later and these type of waves generally you know they are generated by this uh, surface boundary condition okay suppose if it is an infinite medium say in an infinite medium there will be no surface wave at all you will have only body waves but when you are having a finite medium so because of the boundary condition the stresses are zero or something else or whatever we have so you will see this type of uh, surface waves only now uh, you know of course there is to distinguish this one say of course as already i told you uh, you know this uh, the p wave and s wave you know the, let's say essentially they are related to you know this uh, normal stresses and uh, shear stresses itself compressional waves and then shear waves also they say and then you know, they change in volume basically so this rally wave is also you know is a one type of compressional wave normal stresses kind of a thing and p wave is also compressional wave shear waves you know this low wave and s wave say of course low wave is a surface uh, wave and s wave is a body wave but both their mechanisms if you see they come under shear waves and other one comes under compressional waves so you can do this type of classification also instead of surface and body we can also classify into compression and then shear you know uh, you can classify these type of waves also okay now the sources of elastic waves is said so of course earthquakes happens then volcanic eruptions also will create elastic waves only 
then explosions also wind also will create these elastic fields like in mars is atmospheric uh, seismology has come recently that insight uh, instrument it has even recorded the atmospheric uh, things also then sonic booms you know the meteorites or whatever so, and of course humans if you are walking there like in moons people have done uh, you know the impacts okay so that also has been uh, you know recorded and that also will generate you know, the elastic waves so now the compressional waves so this uh, body so if you see the p wave say so the name comes as p stands for the primary wave primary means which comes first actually okay and a seismogram so they are the fastest waves itself and the first waves set to arrive on a seismogram and of course these waves they travel to all kinds of material solid liquid gases everything they travel and of course in our earth people have already measured the velocity so the velocity of p wave is something around 1 to 14 km per uh, second itself okay so they pro they travel this much faster you know, in the material itself and of course the exact velocity depends on the rock type that's obvious you know so these are how the compressional wave looks like okay so here you can see the wave is going from this side to this side how if you see the individual particles how the particle is vibrating no. wave is going in this direction from left to right and the particle is also going from which direction from which direction to which direction now you see the individual particles say so the individual particle is also vibrating in which direction wave is going from left to right individual particle is also vibrating in which direction same direction left to right the same direction excellent okay it is a parallel only so wave is also going if the wave is going from left to right sir metal uh, prop uh, the metal to the particles also are going from this way so this is what you know what we call as a compression tension kind of uh, wave itself okay and now so this you can easily identify in a seismogram so this was uh, you know some mexico earthquake or whatever so vertical component radial component transverse component okay and now uh, where is this uh, one uh, so the p waves where you can see here uh, so p wave is a compression tension kind of a thing so you can observe this p wave clearly on the vertical component and on the radial component why it is not there in the transverse component no in the transverse component there is no p wave what is the reason no. if you see this one you will understand no. so what happens no. so uh, i told right the coordinate system north west east say now you rotate into radial transverse so radial component is this one transverse is like this and of course vertical is perpendicular to our uh, computer basically and now why you don't see a p wave in the transverse direction tell me because particle vibrate in the direction of the wave yeah so now from so this so in the radial so the particles also the energy is coming in this direction okay so the particles also vibrate in this direction but in transverse direction energy is coming like this but transverse means it should operate in opposite direction so you will not see p waves in the transverse component okay because of it this one so you can easily mathematically also we can show and the data also you know nicely shows this uh, vibrations also so p waves you can observe on vertical and radial components okay this is the most important thing transverse components so you will not be seeing this uh, p wave at all okay this is a very important information and now the shear waves is there this is also body wave shear waves and of course the shear you know all of you know right liquids and gases it doesn't pass and its velocity in our earth say is 198 km per second it varies basically okay the shear wave velocity and of course depending on the rock type and depending on pressure you know inside earth you know the surface and other things it matters say the velocity matters a lot here okay and now this is a vibration how the shear wave the mode of vibration and now you can see the wave is going from left to right now how the particles are vibrating Perpendicular, up and down. Perpendicular to the vibration, basically. Okay, there it was a parallel, but energy is moving from left to right only. Okay, the wave is also going from left to right only. Previously it was a parallel, and now this is a perpendicular type of a mode shape, you can say. And now uh, you can see here. Now uh, you know you can clearly observe the shear waves in all these components, vertical, radial, and transverse side. and of course the transverse component you will see you know the most uh, you know the important that is shear wave you can see clearly so this is how you know the waves you know they look like actually so first comes is a p wave then one comes is of course transverse component also p wave will be there because in earth you know it is not perfectly radial transverse and other things also but the p wave amplitudes will be very small here okay so this is how you know the s wave comes next actually and after this is say So now you will see the Rayleigh waves actually. Now you can see the Rayleigh wave mode shape. How the particle is vibrating here? 
Uh, so you see this blue color particle. So how it is vibrating? Yeah. So the wave is coming from left to right only. Yeah. Now what type of mode it is? How it is vibrating? Sir, in sine wave function. No, no, it's a particle I'm saying. It is not sine wave. It's a blue color. If we see how it is oscillating, you can say downside, but no, exact blue color that point. If we see now what type, how it is vibrating, what type of shape it is. Sir, opposite Tell me, Uttar. Sir, opposite to the wave. Opposite to the wave, but what type of shape it is? Like this blue point is there. If you see clear land, if you draw the entire uh, thing, say it oscillates in uh, what type circular. of uh, circular or ellipse kind of thing? You know, you cannot be exact circular. This one now you see the blue point on the top one. No? The blue point, if you come to the bottom, say the bottom points, what is happening? What is how they are vibrating? The vibration is more or less? The less. Uh, very less. So what happens as the depth increases, say, below 100 kilometers below or 10 kilometers below, so the surface wave will be zero followed. But you will see only on the mass surface, they will be very high. But as depth increases, say, there the thing uh, goes down actually. And the speed is two to five kilometers per second, basically. So that is what you know, they have measured this uh, reality of this itself. And you can see clearly here, okay? So when you rotate the components, say, and rally wave is also compression, uh, you know, that type of wave itself, you can see in vertical and radial components. Okay, transverse component, you will not see rally waves. And you can see, so first P wave came, then S wave came, then you will have a rally wave section. And the whose amplitude is higher here among P wave, S wave, rally wave, so which is the higher, which has higher amplitude? Rally waves. So the rally waves will have very extremely high amplitude itself. And then the low waves is there. So now when the wave is coming like this, how the particles are vibrating? Yeah. So you can see the wave is going from this to this direction, but the particles are vibrating in perpendicular direction itself. And these waves, say, their velocity is a 3 to 6 kilometer per second, whereas rally waves velocity is 2 to 5 kilometer per second. So among the surface waves also, low waves, say, they have very, speed is extremely high compared to this uh, rally waves itself. Okay. So when you see the seismogram, sir, you can see the vertical component, radial component, transverse, and the transverse components will say low waves, whose velocity is higher. Low wave velocity is higher. Which, which waves are coming faster? Low or rally waves? Ah, you can see the down one, which is coming first, low wave or rally wave at that point. Ah, which is coming first here? You can see the X axis is in. Ah. Low waves. Uh, low waves, they've come very fast actually. Okay, so this is how you know the modes of vibration we say. Okay, so that's what we say. So now finally, you know, so if you see the modes of vibration set, so this is very important information. Okay, so now we will be having uh, you know the rally waves. So four type of waves you can easily identify P wave, then we have a S wave, then we have a rally wave, and then we have this low waves also. Okay, so these are the modes of vibration for a you know the, that solid or whatever you know, that elastic solid. And you can identify all these things on a seismogram you know, nicely, all these uh, things itself. Okay. So, anyway, so I will stop here. We will continue in our uh, tomorrow's class. Okay. Yeah, so, if there are any doubts, you can ask.